This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. You said that you spent your whole life dreaming about space and also pondering the big existential question of whether there is or isn't intelligent life, intelligent I'll survive. Like, how would we actually communicate? In a way that's like, if we broadcast the signal, you know, and then it could somehow like percolate throughout the universe. It like forces the message to have an impact. Right. My train of thought has never gone gone there, but I like it. And also somewhere in there, I think it's implied that something travels faster than the speed of light. Focus pursuit of uh, moving things through space efficiently. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you zoom out, one of the cool things that this enables us to do is find, well, forget even an intelligent. Solar system, and, and I do think it might be hard to untangle if we somehow contaminated other things as well. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not. Earth-like conditions, how hard is it for life to start? And if you find life on Mars or find life on Europa, that means it's way easier. That's a good thing to confirm that if you have a habitable planet, then there's going to be life. And that like immediately, that's that would be super exciting because that means there's like trillions of planets yes. with basic life out there. Though of all the planets in our solar system, Earth is clearly the most habitable. So uh, I would not be discouraged if we didn't find it on another planet in True. our solar system. True. And again, that life could look very different. It's habitable yeah. for Earth-like life, right. but exactly. it could be... Uh, totally different. I still think that trees are quite possibly more intelligent than humans, but their intelligence is carried out over a time scale that we're just not able to appreciate. Mm -hmm. Like they might be running the entirety of human civilization, and we're just like too dumb to realize <laughs> that they're they're the smart ones. Maybe that's the alien message. It's in the trees. It's in the, in the trees. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not in the uh, monolith in the Utah desert, it's in the trees. Right, yeah. <laughs> so let, let's go to space exploration. Uh, how do you... Uh, like rules you have on Mars. And yeah. uh, speaking of the Cold War, who gets to own the land? You know, you start planting flags, you start to make decisions. And uh, like SpaceX has this nice, it's probably a little bit trolly, but they have this nice paragraph in their contracts where it's like, it's it talks about that uh, like human uh, governments on earth or earth governments have no uh, jurisdiction. Perhaps that needs to be leveraged. Like you have to be very clever about leveraging that to uh, to create a little bit of a Cold War feeling. It seems like we're we, we humans need a little bit of a competition. Do you think that's necessary to su succeed in um, to get the the necessary investment, or can the pure pursuit of science be enough? No, I think we're seeing right now the pure pursuit of science, I mean, that results in pretty tiny budgets for exploration. Um, there has to be some disaster, impending doom um, to get us onto 
another planet in a permanent way. I don't know financially. I just don't know if the private sector can support that. And but I don't. But there's not enough short-term business. I guess that's how business works. Like you should have a <laughs> you should have a path to making money in like the next ten years. Well, and maybe even more broadly and and looping back to something we we said earlier, I don't know that getting humans off this planet and you know spreading um like bacteria is what we're supposed to be doing in the first place. So yeah. maybe we can go, but should we and and I'm probably a an unusual person for thinking that in my industry because humans want to explore. But I almost wonder, you know, are we putting unnecessary obstacles like uh, we're very finicky biological things in the way of some more robotic or you know more silicon based exploration um, I, but i do think that removing you know it's hard for humans to even make a trip to mars much less go anywhere farther than that. And I think we'll have, you know, more this again, I'm probably unusual. And but if not, you know, maybe not even that Petri dish. Um, so I see, I think what I'm saying is, you know, I see a, a much bigger role in the future of AI for space exploration. It's kind of sad to think that, uh, I mean, I'm sure we'll eventually send a spacecraft with uh, efficient propulsion, like some of the stuff you work on, out that travels just really far with some robots on it and with some with some DNA in a petri yeah. dish, and then human civilization destroys itself, and then they'll just be this floating spacecraft that eventually gets somewhere. Dead. Well, it it's depends, it depends on what the what the goal is, right? <laughs> <laughs> Another way to look at is. it is yeah. we've preserved it's like a little time capsule of knowledge, DNA, you know, that we've and we might want to be sending robots up there. You want it to be a human that goes out there. Would you like to one day travel to Mars? You know, if it's it, if it becomes sort of more open to civilian travel and that kind of thing, like, are you uh, like vacation wise? Like, if you talk, if we're talking vacations, would you like to vacation on Earth or vacation on Mars? I wish that I had a better answer, but no, I wanted to be an astronaut because I. First of all, I like working in labs and doing experiments and. Um, I wanted to go to like the coolest lab, the ISS, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. and do some experiments there. Uh, that's being decommissioned, which is sad, but you know, there will be others, I'm sure. Um, the ISS is being decommissioned. Yes. I think by 2025, it's not going to be in use anymore, but I think, um, there are other, there are private companies that are going to be putting up stations and things. So it's primarily like a research lab, essentially. Yes. A research lab in space. That's a cool way to say it. it's like the coolest possible research yes. lab. That's where I wanted to go. And now, though, my, you know, risk profile has changed a little bit. I have three little ones yeah. and um, I won't, I won't be in the first thousand people to go to Mars. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Earth is kind of nice. We have our troubles, but overall, it's pretty nice. Again, it's the Netflix. Okay, let's talk rockets. Uh, how does a rocket engine work, or any kind of engine that can? It's chemical because it's loud and there's fire, um, and that's what's used for launch and is 
more televised. So um, in in those types of systems, you usually have a, f- a fuel on an oxidizer and um, they react and combust and release stored chemical energy. Um, and, and that energy heats um, heats the resultant gas and and that's funneled out the back through a nozzle uh, directed out the back and and then that momentum exchange um, pushes the spacecraft forward. Is there an interesting difference in liquid and solid fuel in those contexts? They're both lumped in the same. So uh, chemical just means that the release of energy from from those bonds essentially. So a solid fuel works the same way. Uh, and the other main category is electric propulsion. So instead of chemical energy, you're using electrical energy, um, usually from, you know, batteries or solar panels. And uh, in this case, the stuff you're pushing out the back uh, would be charged particles. So um, instead of combustion and heat, you you end up with charged particles and you force them out the back of the spacecraft using either an electrostatic field or electromagnetic. Um, and But it's the same momentum exchange and, and same idea, stuff out the back and everything else goes forward. Cool, so those are the big two categories. What What's the difference maybe in like the challenges of each, the use cases of each, and uh, how they're used today, the physics of each, like, mm. and where they're used, all that kind of stuff. Anything interesting about the two categories that distinguishes them, besides the the chemical one being the big sexy flames and yeah, fire, fire, <laughs> yeah. Chemical is very well understood. Um, you know, a uh, in its simplest form, it's like a firework. So it's been around since. 400 BC or something like that. Um, so that even the big engines are quite well understood. I think you know one of the one of the last gaps there is probably um, what exactly are the products of combustion? Um, our modeling abilities kind of fall apart there. you know, having to venture into um, lots of different interdisciplinary fields of science to try to solve that. And that's quite complex, but we have pretty good um, models for some of the more like emergent behaviors of that system anyways. But that's, I think, one of the last unsolved pieces. Um, and really the the n- kind of what people care about there is is making it more fuel efficient. So the chemical stuff, um, you can get a lot of um, instantaneous thrust, but it's not very fuel efficient. It's much more fuel efficient to go with the electric type of propulsion. Um, So that's where people spend a lot of their time um, is trying to make that more efficient in terms of thrust per unit of fuel. And then um, there's always considerations like heating and cooling it's very hot which is good if it heats the gases but you know bad if it melts the rocket and and things like that so there's always a lot of work on heating and cooling and and the engine cycles and things like that um and then on electric propulsion i find it like much more refreshingly poorly understood. Uh, <laughs> Lots more mysteries. Yeah, I think so. Um, one of the classes I took in college, spent we spent 90% of the class on chemical propulsion and then the last 10% on electric. And the professor said, like, we only sort of understand how it works, but it works kind of. And it's like, that's, that's, that's what interesting. Work on. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, even uh, an ion engine, which is probably one of the most straightforward because it's it has just an it's just an electrostatic engine but it has this really awesome combination of like quantum mechanics and um, material science and fluid dynamics and uh, electrostatics and and um, it's just very intriguing to me 
Um, First of all, can you actually zoom out even more? Like, because you mentioned ion propulsion yeah. engine is a subset of, of electric. Electri mm -hmm. So, like, maybe is there a categories of electric engines, and then we can zoom in on ion propulsion? Yes. So, sure. There's um, the two most kind of conventional types that have been around since the 60s are ion engines and hall thrusters. And ion engines are a little bit simpler because they don't use a magnetic field for generating thrust. Um, and then there are also um, some other types of plasma engines, but that don't fit into those two categories. So just kind of other plasma like um, a Vasimir engine, which we could get into. Um, and then those are probably the main three categories that would be fun to talk about. Oh, and then, of course, the category um, of engine that I work on, which is um, has a lot of similarities to an ion engine, but um, a neutral gas like xenon or argon. Uh, so you inject that into the chamber, and you also inject um, a, a stream of really hot, high-energy electrons, and everything's just moving around um, very randomly in there. And the the whole goal is to have um, one of those electrons collide with one of those neutral atoms and turn it into an ion. So kick off a secondary electron. And now you have... Plasma. Uh, yes. Okay. And now you have... <laughs> good. Um, uh, and now you have a charged, you know, xenon or argon ion and, and more electrons and so on. Um, and then uh, some fraction of those ions will happen to make it to this downstream um, electric field that we set up between two grids with holes in them. Mm. And, you know, in terms of area, the same amount of those ions also makes runs into the walls and lose their charge and um, that's where some of the inefficiencies come in. But the very lucky few make it to those holes in, in that grid. And there are um, two grids, actually, and you apply a, a voltage differential between them, and, and that sets up an electric field. And a charged particle in an electric field uh, creates a force. Uh, and so those ions are accelerated out the back of the engine, and the reaction force is um, is what pushes the spacecraft forward. Um, if you're, you know, following along and tallying these charges, now we've just sent a positive beam of ions out the back of the spacecraft. Um, and, and for our purposes here, the spacecraft is neutral. So eventually, um, those ions will come back and hit the spacecraft because it's a positive beam. So you also have to have an external cathode, um, producer of electrons outside the engine that pumps electrons into that beam and neutralizes that. So now it's net neutral everywhere and it won't come back to the spacecraft. So that's that's an ion engine. What temperature are we talking about here? So in terms of like the, the chemical base engines, those are super hot. Uh, you mentioned plasma here. How hot does this thing get? Um. I mean, is that an interesting thing to talk about in a sense that is that an interesting yeah. distinction or is heat? I mean, it's all going to be hot. No. So it, it's important, uh, especially for some of these smaller satellites people are into launching these days. So the it, it's important because you have the plasma, but also those high energy electrons are hot. And um, if you have a lot of those that are going into the walls, you do have to care about the temperature. So um, I, I'm having trouble remembering off the top of my head. I think they're at like 100 electron volts in terms of the electron energy. And then I'd have to remember how to convert that into Kelvin. Can you stick your hand in it? It's not not no, temperature. not recommended. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what's a colloid engine? So the same rocket people that um, came up with with these ideas for electric propulsion um, probably in the middle of, of last century. Uh, also realized that there's one more place to get charged particles from um, if you're going to be using electric propulsion. So you can take a gas. 
you also can um, use as a source of ions. And if you have ions and you put them in a field, you generate a force. So they recognize that, but um, part of being able to leverage that tech. And then with um, silicon, MEMS, computer processors, and, and when foundry started becoming more ubiquitous, and my advisor um, started at MIT, uh, kind of put those ideas back together and was like, hey, actually, there's now a way to build this and bring this other technique to life. Um, and so the way that the way that you actually get the the ions out of those liquids um, is you put the liquid in a in again a strong electric field. And the electric field stresses the liquid. And you keep increasing the field, and eventually the liquid will assume a, I'll go this way, a, a conical shape. Um, it's, the, it's when the electric field pressure that's pulling on it exactly balances the liquid's own restore. Because uh, it goes um, uh, as one over the radius, and one over the radius squared. And instead of the electric field going to infinity and maybe like generating a wormhole or something, um, a jet of ions instead starts you know, issuing from mm -hmm. the tip of, of that liquid. So the field becomes strong enough there that you can pull ions um, out of the liquid. What is the liquid? We're we talking about with, so, um, or is it the, there's a bunch of different ones. You can do it with... Um, with different types of liquids, it depends on you know how easily you can free ions from their neighbors and if it really wide range of temperatures. This sounds like really cool. It, <laughs> okay, yes. so how big is the uh, how big is the cone? Are we talk uh, what what's the size of this cone that so generates the if ions? If you have a cone that's emitting pure ions, um, the I can't remember if it's the radius or diameter, but um, that emission is happening from, of that cone is something like 20 nanometers. Oh, <laughs> I was so. imagining something slightly bigger, but so like this is, so this is tiny, tiny. Yes. Hence the only being able to do it recently. Yeah, that's right. So this is all controlled by a computer, I guess, like, or like, how, how do you control, <laughs> so, how do you create a cone that generates ions? There are thousands of sharp structures and then supply the liquid to the tips. So that does a few things. Um, it makes sure that we know where the ion beams are forming so we can put holes in the grid above them to let them actually leave instead of hitting, so right? Cool. <laughs> um, but it also reduces the actual field we have to, the voltage we have to apply to create that field because the field will be much stronger if we can already give the liquid a tip to form on. Um, and those tips we form have radii of curvature um, on the order of probably like single microns. So we are working at a little bit larger scale, but once we create that support and the electric field can be focused at that tip, then the tiny little cone can form. On so wait, so th there's something in the, there's an already like a hard material yes. that like gives you the base for the cone mm -hmm. and then you're pouring like liquid over it, whatever. From the, the bottom, that... yeah, it's porous. So we actually supply it from the back of the chip and then And then liquid wicks. forms on top yeah. on, on that structure. Yeah. And then you somehow make it like super sharp, the liquid, mm -hmm. so the ions can, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and then we've applied that field to get those <laughs> ions, and that same field then accelerates them. That's awesome. And there's like a bunch of these. Yeah, like, I should have, I should have brought something. Um, so we well, you could just pretend that yes. you have some nanometer cones on. on so the table actually, here. you know, <laughs> kind of about this scale, um, we build, we call them thruster chips. Because I think I've seen pictures of you with like a tiny thing in your yeah. hand. That must be the thing. Okay, yeah. so, so that's that. an engine. Um, so that is kind of the ionization chamber and thrust producing part of it. What's not shown, 
you know, in that picture, um, is the propellant tank. So we can keep supplying more and more of the liquid to those um, emission sites. And then we also provide a power electronic system that talks to the spacecraft and turns our device on and off. So that's the colloid engine. Yeah. That's the core of the colloid engine. Um, it's the way I've been talking about it. It's um, more of ion electrospray colloid um, tends to mean like liquid droplets coming off of the jet. But if you make smaller and smaller cones, you get pure ions. So we're kind of like a subset of colloid, yes. What uh, aspects of this? You said that it's been full of mystery from the physics perspective. What aspects of this are understood and what are still full of mystery? Yeah, recently um, we've been understanding the kind of instabilities and and stable regimes of um, you know how much liquid do you supply and and what field do you apply and um, why is it flickering on and off or why does it have these weird behaviors? So that's in the past just couple years that's um, become much more understood. Um, I think the two areas that come to Understand the beam performance of of the engine. Is that a theory question or is that an engineering question? Theory, definitely. We're Axion is a, a startup, and we're more in the business of building and testing and observing um, and characterizing, um, and we're not really diving much into the, that theory right now. Okay, so zoom, zooming out a little bit on the physics. Uh, apologize for the way too big of a question, but. To you, from either us, you mentioned Axion is you know more of sort of an engineering endeavor, right? Mm -hmm. But from a perspective of physics in general, science in general, or the side of engineering, what do you think is the most to you like beautiful and captivating and inspiring idea in this space? In this space, and then I'm going to zoom out a little bit more. But um, in this space, I keep butting up against material science questions. So I, over the past 10 years, I feel like every problem or interesting I want to dig in more there. And um, I was just, you know, even for our technology, when we have to move the propellant from the tank to the tip of the emitters, we rely a lot on capillary action and you're getting into wetting and surface energies. At a scale and, of like nano. Yeah, scale. I mean, you're, it's, it all, if you look further, it's quantum too, but it, it all is, you know. Wait, the capillary action. And it's, you know, just a partial differential equation, but that kind of connectedness of the universe, you know, I, well, I don't want to use <laughs> options pricing and the universe in the same, but you know what I mean? This connectedness I find really magical. Yeah, the patterns that mathematics reveals yes. seems to echo in a bunch of different places. Yes. Yeah, there's just weirdness. It's like... propulsion of a rocket from Earth when you're standing on the ground to orbit, and then the kind of propulsion necessary for once you get out to orbit or to, to like deep space to, to move, move around. You can still reach speeds that are um, very interesting for exploration and, and even for missions with humans on them. Um, uh, an interesting direction I think we need to go as as humans exploring space is um, the power supplies. Um, and nuclear power, um, you, we could have a lot more powerful electric propulsion systems, so they would be extremely fuel efficient, but more instantaneous thrust to do more interesting missions um, if we could start launching more nuclear 
systems, but uh, so like so something that's powered, nuclear powered, that's the right way to say it. Yeah. That, but is in a small enough container that could be launched. Yeah. So, um, I mean, as a world, we do launch um, spacecraft with nuclear power systems on board, but size is is one consideration. It hasn't been a big focus. So the the reactors and the heaters and everything are bulky. And so they're really only suitable for some of the much bigger interplanetary stuff. Um, so that's one issue, but then it's a whole like rat's nest of political stuff as well. I, I heard, uh, I think Elon described or somebody, but I think, I think it was Elon that described the uh, EV to all like electrical mm. vertical takeoff and landing vehicles. So basically saying rockets, I'm mean, obviously the, Elon is interested in electric vehicles, right? But he said that rockets can't, uh, in the in the near term, it doesn't make sense for them to be electrical. Uh, what, do you see a world with the rockets that we use to get into orbit are also electric based? Uh, it's possible. You can produce the thrust levels you need, but you need this uh, a much bigger power supply, and, and like I think that would be nuclear. And the only way people have been able to launch them at all is people would still have an issue with that, but someday. It's, a, it's an interesting concept, nuclear. It seems like people, like everybody that works on nuclear power has shown how safe it is as a source of energy. I know, right? And, uh, and yet we are seem to be, I mean, based on the history, based on the excellent HBO series, <laughs> I'm Russian with the Chernobyl. It seems like we have our risk estimation about this particular power source is uh, drastically inaccurate. But that's, that's yeah. a fascinating idea that we would use nuclear as a source for our vehicle. <laughs> Trump eased up a little bit on the regulations and NASA and hopefully others are they're starting to pick up on the development. So now is a good time to look into it because there's actually some movement. Is that a hope for you to, to explore different energy sources that the entirety of the vehicle? And you would have to do it in the same way we do different stages of rockets now, where once you've used up an an engine um, or a stage, you let it go because there's really no point in holding on to it. So I wouldn't necessarily want to use the the same engine for the whole thing, but the same technology, I think, would be interesting. Okay, so it's possible. All right, but... Uh, yeah, it in comes terms down to the power source. The power source, it's, that's really interesting. But for the current power sources and its current use cases, what's the use case for electric, like the... Uh, the the colloid engine. Can you talk about where they're used today? Sure. So, chemical engines are still used um, quite a bit once you're in orbit, but that's also where you might choose instead to use an electric system. And what people do with them, and and this includes you know the ion engines and hall thrusters and R engine. Um, is basically any maneuvering you need to do once you're dropped off. Um, there's, even if your only goal was to just stay in your orbit and not move for the life of your mission, you need propulsion to accomplish that because the Earth's gravity field changes as you go around in orbit and pulls you out of your little box. Um, there are other perturbations um, that can throw you off a bit. Um, and then, you know, most people want to do things a little bit more interesting, like uh, maneuver to avoid being hit by space debris, or uh, perhaps lower their orbit to take a higher resolution image of something and then return. Um, at the end of your mission, uh, you're supposed to responsibly get rid of your satellite, whether that's um, burning it up, but if you're in geo, um, you want to push it higher into graveyard orbit. Um, what's geo? What's what's um, so low graveyard? Earth orbit and then geosynchronous orbit or geostationary orbit? And there's a graveyard. 
What's yeah, so those satellites are at um, like 40,000 kilometers. So if they were to try to push their satellites um, back down to burn up in the atmosphere, they would need you know even more propulsion than they've had for the whole lifetime of their mission. So instead, they push them higher, where it'll take you know a million years for it to naturally deorbit. Um, so we're also cluttering that higher bit up as well, but it's not as pressing as as Leo, which is low Earth orbit, where more of these commercial missions are going now. Cool. So what, how hard is the collision avoidance problem there? You said some debris and stuff. So like, how much? propulsion is needed like how much is uh, the life of a satellite is just like oh crap trying trying to avoid like little yeah, things around there i think one of the recent um you know rules of thumb i heard was per year some of these small satellites are doing like three collision avoidance maneuvers um so that's oh, not that's not bad. yeah but it's well, not zero um and it yeah it takes a lot of that could be become affordable if it's like if it gets hit maybe it won't be damaged kind of thing that kind of logic affordable in that instead of launching one satellite they'll launch you know 20 small ones yeah so yeah. if one gets taken out yeah. that's okay but the problem is that you know one good sized satellite getting hit um that's like a ballistic event that turns into 10,000 pieces of debris that oh, then right. are the things that go and hit the other oh, satellites, yeah. yeah. So do you, do you see a world where, like in your sense, in your own work and just in the space industry in general, do you see that the people are moving towards bigger satellites or smaller satellites? Is there going to be a mix? Like what's, and what are we talking, what, what does it mean for a satellite to be big and, what's, and small? What size so are we talking So big, about? the space. Different you know, to give you the two ends of the spectrum. Um, big satellites will, I think they're here to stay, at least as far as I can see into the future, um, for things like broadcasting. Um, you want to be able to, you know, broadcast to as many people as possible. Um, there, You also can't just go to small satellites um, and say Moore's Law for things like optics, so if you have an an aperture on your satellite, you know that just that doesn't follow Moore's law. That's that's different. So it's always going to be the size it it will be. You know, unless there's some new physics that comes out that I'm not aware of. Um, but if ability and opening up access to space to more and more people. Well, what's the smallest satellite you've seen go up there? Like, what what are the smallest kind? You said. You can, you know, track a ship going across the ocean as like if you need to, if you're just pinging something, you know, yeah. you can handle that that amount of data um, and, and so those latencies to, and so on. You have to have propulsion on that. You have to have a little engine. No, those are just like that satellite phone. Um, you know, you're you're limited by your transponders and and so on. So to serve more people, you actually need more satellites and and perhaps at the rate, you know, our data consumption and things are going these days. Um, yeah, I can see tens of thousands of satellites. Can I ask you a ridiculous question? Yes. So I've recently watched this documentary on Netflix about uh, flat earthers. Mm -hmm. That you know the people that believe in a flat Earth. As somebody, as somebody who develops propulsion systems for 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 satellites and for spacecraft, what's uh, to use the most convincing evidence that the Earth is round? Probably some of the photos taken from the Moon. Photos from the moon. Okay, yeah. so it's not from the from the satellite space. You yeah, like... I think seeing though that perspective, I maybe I'm just I'm answering to personally because I really love those photos. Because they're beautiful. Yeah, I really like the ones that show the moon and um, the lunar lander, and they're taken 
a little bit farther back. So you see Earth, and first you're like, wow, that's tiny, and we're insignificant, and that's kind of sad. But then you see this really cool thing that we landed on another, yeah. you know, planetary body and you're like oh okay can you actually see her i, I, I don't i don't know yeah if I i'll send you those. i'll send you that picture because i love the pictures or videos of just earth from more from orbit and so on right like yeah those that's really beautiful that, that's like a perspective shifter that's the pale blue dot right it's probably appears tiny yeah and just that you know juxtaposition of the insignificance but you're another. We built other. this really cool thing. <laughs> yeah, um, take I just the love that. Yeah. Oh, that'd be cool. I can't. I personally love the idea of humans stepping on Mars. I'm such a sucker for the romantic notion of that and being able to take pictures from Mars. Like, so selfies. you would go. I. Uh, <laughs> I. Uh, yeah, I would be. What did you say? You said you wouldldn't be not in the, the first, first thousand. For th thousand. Yeah. Which it's funny because. To me, that's that's brave to be in the first million. I think when the uh, Declaration of Independence was signed in the United States, that was like two million people. So I would like to show up when they're signing those documents. Okay. Flix. So, yeah, maybe not in the first million, but the first hundred uh, thousand. It's exciting to define the direction of a new, like how often do we not just have a revolution to redefine our government, as you know, smaller countries sure. are still doing to this day, start over. But, but literally start over from, from scratch. There's uh, just our financial system. It could be like based on cryptocurrency. You could think about like how democracy, you know, we have, we have now, the technology that can enable pure democracy, for example, if we choose to do mm, that, yeah, as opposed to representative democracy, all those kinds of things. So we talked about two uh, different forms of propulsion, which are super exciting. Well, or maybe even within the space of even just like, like even ion engines, is there like breakthroughs that might 10x the thing, like really improve it? So, you know, the real game changer would be propellantless propulsion. And so every couple of years you see a new, now a startup or um, a researcher comes up with some contraption for producing thrust that didn't require, you know, we've been talking about conservation of momentum mass times velocity out the back, um, mass so there's times usually velocity mass. forward. Yes, That's what... exactly. And you have to, you know, carry that up with you or find it on an asteroid or harvest it from somewhere if you didn't bring it with you. So not having to do that would be, you know, one of the ultimate game changers. Um, and, and I, you know, unless there are... be real and could be something that that we use eventually. What would um, be the power source? Yeah, the most recent engine like this that has was just debunked this year, I think in in March or something was called the M drive and um supposedly you, you used a power source so, you know, batteries or solar panels to generate microwaves into this resonant cavity and People claimed it. Um, you know, their wow. momentum was okay. conserved. Um, and I don't, you know, I whatever. Um, but finally, someone, I think at NASA, built the device, tested it, got the same thrust, then unhooked it, flipped it backwards and turned it on, but got the same thrust in the same direction again. And so they're like, this is just an interaction with the test setup or, you know, some the chamber or something like that. Well said. So um thwarted again. Um, but you know, it would it would be so wonderful for everybody if we could figure out how to do it. But I d I don't know. That's an interesting twist on it because that's more about efficient travel, long distance travel, right? That's not necessarily about speed. That's more sure. about enabling, like, yeah, less. So, hook that up to the nuclear power supply yeah. 
there you go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but still, w w in terms yeah. of speed, in terms of trying to, so there, there's recently, uh, already I think, been propulsion. And do, do you think about what kind of propulsion will allow us to travel close to the speed of light? or, you know, half the speed of light, all those kinds of things that would allow us to get to Proxima Centauri in a reasonable, in a lifetime? You know, there's the Project Breakthrough Starshot. Yeah. Um, that's looking at sending those tiny little chip sets um, And like there, accelerating actually. really fast. Yeah, using a laser. So launching them, and then while they're still relatively close to the Earth, you know, blasting them with some... I forget what even what power level you needed to to accelerate them fast enough to get there in twenty Super years. Super crazy sounding, but uh, a lot of people say that's a legitimate. Like it's crazy sounding, but you can actually pull it off. Yeah, I love that project because there are a lot of different aspects. You know, there's the laser. There's how do you then. Um, get enough power when you're there to send a signal back. No part of that project is possible right now, but I think it's really exciting. Yeah. But do you, uh, do you see like yeah. human, uh, like a spacecraft with a human on it, so it's like a heavy one, being like us inventing new propulsion systems entirely. Like, do you ever see yeah. that in the on the radar of propulsion systems like that, or are they completely out there in the impossible? Well, we're going to quickly leave the realm of what I can describe with any credibility, but yes. um, I think I think because of special relativity, if we tried to accelerate some mass so close to the speed of light, it becomes infinitely heavy, and then we just don't. We'd have to like harness a lot of suns to do that, or you know, it's just that. We'll see it, but um, yeah, someday. You, uh, you're the co-founder of just like we've been talking about Axion Systems. Uh, yeah, it's a would you say a space propulsion company? Yes, broadly speaking. Um, so, uh, how do you? Big question. How do you uh, build a rocket company from like <laughs> a propulsion company from one person from two people? to 10 people plus, and actually, you know, take it to a successful product. Yeah, well, I think the early stage is quite, uh, I'm not supposed to use the word easy when you work in rocket science, but straightforward. Um, when you're working on something, you know, sexy, like an ion engine, it's more straightforward to raise money and, and get people. <laughs> Is it, uh, is it luck? Is there a system? Like how, in terms of the people you've connected with, the, the people um, you built the company with, is there some thread, some commonality, some pattern that you find it to be, to hold for what makes a great team? <laughs> Um, even, you know, weirder than that is just really getting, you know, having weird, uncomfortable conversations with people like at a conference and getting over the small talk quickly and getting to know them quickly and having a relationship that stands out and then being able to call on them later because of that. Um, and I think that's, it's, that's been because I'm introverted and I you know, want to poke my eyes out instead of go and do small talk. And so yeah. I huddle in a corner with one person and, you know, we talk about aliens or things like yeah. that. And um, so, you know, that's all to say that, you know, having a strong network, I think is really important, but a genuine one. And let's see other ways to build a rocket company, kind of making sure you're paying attention to the sweeping trends of the industry. <laughs> in adjusted dollars for an ion engine and seeing that 
now people are going to want to pay 10K for an ion engine um, and just staying wow. out ahead of that and those kinds of things. Um, so, you know, being out in the industry and, and talking to as That's many crazy. people as possible. So there's a drive. I mean, I yeah. suppose SpaceX really it's pushed that. Frustrating. Like big problems, I would say, in the, in the following sense. I see this in the car industry, for example, that uh, people have, it's such a small margin for profit. Like they've driven the cost of everything down so much that there's literally no room for innovation, for yes. taking risks. So like cars, which is funny because not until Tesla really, which is one of the, you know, long for rocket space too, is like, you, if you're cutting out costs, you can't afford to innovate, to try out new things. And then mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. that's definitely true with the ion engine then, right? Uh, so, but what, um, so how do you compete in this, uh, in this space? Do you, by the way, see SpaceX mm -hmm. as a competitor? Uh, and what do you say in general about the competition in the space? Is it really difficult as a as a business to compete here? No, I I don't see SpaceX as a competitor, um, and I see them as one day, not too long from now, a customer. Hopefully, a customer. <laughs> um, I mean to compete against that. I think you just have to do things in an unconventional way. So bringing silicon MEMS manufacturing to propulsion. You know, NASA doesn't make ion engines using a batch mass producible technique. They have, you know, one guy that's been making their ion engines for 20 years, like bespoke pieces of jewelry. So mm -hmm. uh, bringing things to what you're trying to innovate to to make them, you know, in our case, more cost effective was was really key. Difficult things for our human civilization, and uh, it's been a lot of. First of all, it's an election year. There's been a lot of drama and division about that. There's been riots of all different um, reasons, racial division. There's been obviously a virus that's testing the very fabric of our society. But there's been really, I, for me at least, super positive things, which inspiring things, which is uh, SpaceX and NASA uh, doing the first commercial yeah. human f flight, uh, launching humans to space and did it twice successfully. Mm -hmm. uh, what is that? Um, did you get to watch that launch? Did you, uh, what does it make you feel? Uh, do you think this is uh, first days for a new era of um, space exploration? Yeah, I did watch it. We played it outside on a big screen at That's our awesome. place. And um, I was a little, you know, they kept saying Bob and Doug, Bob and Doug. And, you know, astronauts usually are... Um, treated with a little bit more fanfare. So it felt very casual, but maybe that was a good a good thing. Like this is the era of commercial crude missions and Oh, it was it was a little bit more um Yeah, exactly. More like fun, playful, celebrity type of Yes, exactly. astronaut versus um uh, the, the realize that astronauts are coming and going all the time, you know, splashing back down. And it's just so common now, but it, that's quite magical, I think. Um, so yes, we did watch that. I love, love, love that we finally have that capability again to send people to the space station. Um, and it's just really exciting to see the private sector step in the science and exploration part. And I think 
our pace is too slow there, you know, for my liking, I suppose. What do you mean on the scientific? Uh, okay, so did you have, I mean, on the cost thing, do you feel like NASA was a little too bureaucratic in a sense, like too slow, too heavy cost wise in their effort, like when they were running things purely without any commercial involvement? So I suppose it's more that I just want the government to fund. We should be spending more money there and and not less. And um, other countries are starting to spend more and more, and I think we'll fall we'll fall behind because of that. So you have quite a bit of experience, first of all, start starting a company yourself, but also I saw maybe you can correct me, but you you have a quite quite a bit of knowledge of. Um, just in, in general, the startup experience of building companies that you've interacted with people. If is there is there advice that you can give to somebody, to a founder, co-founder who wants to launch and grow a new company and do something big and impactful in this world? Yes, uh, I would say, you know, like I mentioned earlier, but make sure the vision is something that, you know, will get you out of bed in the morning and, and will get, and that you can rally other people around you to, to achieve. Uh, Cause I see a lot of folks that sort of cared about something or saw a window of opportunity to do something and, you know, startups are hard and, and more often than not, just being opportunistic isn't going to be enough to make it through all the really crappy um, things that are going to happen. So the vision just helps you psychologically to carry through the hardships, for you and the team. Yeah, the you and the team. Yeah, yeah, exactly. To kind of younger people interested in getting into entrepreneurship, I would say, you know, stay as close to like first principles and and fundamentals as you can for as long as you can. Um, because really understanding the problems, you know, if it's something scientific or hardware related or um, even if it's not, but having a deep understanding of of the problem and the customers and what people care about and um, how to move something forward is more important than taking all of the entrepreneurship classes in undergrad. So being able to think deeply, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Well, have you been surprised about how much like pivoting is involved? Like basically rethinking what you thought initially would be the right direction to go? Or is there, yeah. if you think deeply enough that uh, you can s stick in the same direction for long enough? So our, you know, our guiding star hasn't changed at all. Um, so that's been pretty consistent. But we, within that, we flip flop on so many things um, all the time. And, you know, to give you one example, it's do you stop and build a first product that's well suited to maybe a smaller, less exciting segment of the market? Or do you stay head down and focus on, you know, the big swing and, and trying to hit it out of the park right away? And we've flip-flopped between that. And there's not a blanket answer and there are a lot of factors, but um, that's a hard one. And I think one one other piece for the aspiring. Like the founders or, or executives at companies purposefully carve out time and, and acknowledge that, yes, this is going to take a lot of my time and resources. And then but you see them after the fact trying to repair the, you know, bro culture or whatever else is broken at the company. Um, and I think that it's starting to change. Um, but just to be aware of it from the beginning is important. Right. I guess it should be part of the vision of what kind of place you want to create. Or what kind of, like, human beings. Yeah, exactly. Like, you can't wait for five, 10 years, and then just slap an HR person on to trying to fix it. Like it has to be thoughtful from the beginning. Yeah. Don't, don't get me started on HR people. <laughs> uh, 
don't leave HR to HR people, but I'll just leave it at that. You didn't say that. I said it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, HR's actual HR is really important. Is is so so yes, important. But yeah. so culture is so important. Yeah. So. And then I also was surprised. Like I thought you could say here will be our culture and our values and that it was kind of distinct from who I and my co-founder were as people. And I was like, yeah. no, that's not how that works. Yeah. We just kind of like ooze out our behaviors and then the company. Relationship, but as opposed to a relationship with two people, it's a relationship with many people. Yeah. And uh, you, yeah, you communicate so much. And you have to think about exactly the right way to lose your shit if you're going to, or if at all. Yeah. You have to really think through that because it sends a big signal. Uh, you know, sometimes that's okay. Like if you do it deliberately, like if you're going to do it deliberately. Because it was going to take longer <laughs> to fix that's, that's the brilliant. behavior. And yeah. then she... I've got, I'm actually a lot better at it now. And it started with things. She's like, every time you walk through a doorway, think, you know, calm and take breaths before responding. <laughs> and there were all sorts of these little yeah, things little we did. And yeah. Or so that you uh, take away from it. Yes. Um, so I've been a voracious reader. <laughs> But um, I love Fitzgerald as an author because he's very, he has very like flowery prose um, that I can just picture what he's saying, but he does it in a, such a creative way. I remember that one in particular because it, you know, I read a ton as a kid too, but it kind of set me, it was like the beginning of my adult reading life and um, getting into classics and um i kind of i do feel like i they seem intimidating maybe and then i realize that they're all just like love stories um uh so yeah isn't everything a you know love story? Yeah, yeah it's yeah. really <laughs> at the bottom even like, you know i don't know i i was surprised that even like a lot of the russian authors um you know that's all they're all yeah. just love stories we're uh, humans are pretty simple. There's not much yeah. to work. There's not much to work with. So, so I think maybe that was it. It made like that whole world less intimidating to me, and and cemented my love That's for cool. reading. People should have just approached the classics. Like, th there's probably a love chick story flicks. in here. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it somehow boils down to a chick flick. Yes. So just relax and, and enjoy the. Rest. Big. Topics. Yeah. So that was very mind opening to me to read that. But it also, I think, is probably part of why I ended up marrying my husband is related. I book into a love story. <gasps> I did. Oh, no. <laughs> so, uh, no, it's good. It's good. It's a, Your robot it's a good has a heart. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and OK, the third uh, series is it's just it's Harry Potter. Um, of course, which yeah. somehow connects to I, I haven't read Harry Potter. I'm really sorry. Oh, no. I'm, I forgive me, forgive me. Uh, but uh, I've read Tolkien, but just Harry okay. Potter, just haven't haven't gotten to it. But uh, uh, your company name is somehow I think connects to Harry yes. Potter, right? I so think they heard this. My, I notably. Harry uses it to summon his broomstick out of his dorm room when he's battling a dragon somewhere else. So he says the spell and the broomstick comes to him. So summoning in that way. Okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> this is brilliant. So the, the, the big thing is that uh, it's something that you carry with, it's like your, car, it's your safe place you return to. Something yeah, like the Harry it, Potter. That... You know, I reread them still. Um, whatever keeps me reading, I think, is is the most important thing. Okay, I got it. So yeah, I'm actually the same way in terms of the habit of it. 
it's important. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's important to just keep, keep yeah, re keep reading. Definitely. But I have found myself struggling a little bit to because I listen to a lot of audiobooks now. I've struggled to then switch back to hmm. reading seriously. Uh, it's just I read so many papers, I read so many other things. It feels like if I'm going to sit down and, fo and have the time to actually focus on the reading, I should be reading like blog posts or papers or more condensed kind of things. Yeah. But there, there's a huge value to just reading long form still. Yeah. And, you know, my husband was never that into fiction, but then someone told him or he heard, um, you know, you learn a lot of empathy through reading fiction. Um, so you could think of it that way. Cause... Well, yeah, that's kind of what, yeah, yeah. The, and it's also fiction is a nice, unlike not less so with nonfiction, is a chance to travel. I see it as kind of mm -hmm. traveling. Yeah. Because you go to nice. this other world and it's, it's nice because it's like much more efficient. You don't have to get on a plane, you don't have to. <laughs> and you get to meet all kinds of new people. It's like people say they love traveling. And I say I love traveling too. I just, yeah, read fiction. I told my um, three-year-old that that was why we read so much because we, you know, see the places in our mind. And I'm like, it's basically like we're watching a movie. You know, that's how it feels. And she's like, I prefer watching Frozen with popcorn. Was her, <laughs> yeah, was her right. response that? Like, well, the, okay, well, you're yeah, three. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's some power to the imagination, right? That's yeah. it's not just like watching a movie because some oh, something right. about of our, of our imagination because it's it's the words and the world that's painted somehow mixing in with our own understanding of yeah. our own hopes and dreams, our fears. It like mixes up in there in the way we construct build up that world from just the page so. yeah you're you're really creating the world just with the like prompts from right. the book right yeah. yeah yeah that's different than watching a movie yeah which is why it hurts sometimes to watch the movie yes. version and then you're like that's, that's not at all how i yeah uh, imagined it well we kind of brought this up in terms of uh the depending on what the goals are let me ask the big, uh, you're, you're friends with Manolis. He's obsessed with this question. So let me ask the big ridiculous question about the meaning of life. Uh, do you have, uh, you ever think about this one? Do you ever uh, ponder the the reason we're here? These descends the vapes on this spinning ball in the middle of nowhere? Yeah, I don't, I don't think one ends up in the field of space propulsion without thinking of these existential questions. Uh, yeah, all the time. Or and, builds a business. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Um, yeah, we've touched on a lot of the different pieces of this, I think. So I, I have a bunch of thoughts. Um, I do think that, you know, the goal isn't the meaning isn't anymore just to be like a petri dish of bacteria that reproduces and um you know where survival and reproduction are the main objectives and maybe it's because now we're able to answer these ask those questions um that's maybe the turning point um and instead i i think it's really the the pursuit and generation of knowledge and and so if if we're taken out by an asteroid or something i think that it will have been a you know meaningful endeavor if somehow our knowledge about the universe uh, preserved is somehow. preserved somehow um and the next civilization isn't starting over again um so that that's that's I always, I, yeah, I, I resonate with that. That I always loved the mission of Google from mm -hmm. the early days of making the world's sort of information and knowledge searchable. Mm -hmm. I always loved that idea. I always loved. I was donated as people should to Wikipedia. Yeah. Uh, I just love Wikipedia. I, I feel like it's the. 
it, that's one of the greatest accomplishments of just a, a humanity of us together, especially Wikipedia in this open, like in this open community way, putting together different knowledge. Just like on everything we've talked about today, I'm sure there's a Wikipedia page about ion engines, and yes. I'm sure it's pretty good. Yeah, like it's I don't know that's that's incredible, and obviously that can be preserved pretty efficiently, at least Wikipedia. I know you just, you'll be like the human civilization is all like burning up in flames as there's this one USB drive slowly traveling yeah, out yeah, <laughs> with exactly. Wikipedia on it. Yep. <laughs> uh, That's on from the beginning of our chat, that one lonely spacecraft. It just needs yeah, Wikipedia. <laughs> and then it will have been a civilization well spent. Um, so pushing that knowledge along yeah. with, through like one little discovery at a time mm -hmm. is, is one of is, is a core aspect of the meaning of it of it all yes and i also i can, i haven't yet figured out what the connection you know an explanation i'm happy with yet for how it's connected but um evolving beyond just the the survival piece too i think like we touched on the the emotional aspect, something in there about cooperation and, you know, love. And so I, in my day-to-day, -day, that just boils down to, you know, the pursuit of knowledge or improving the human condition and being kind. Love and knowledge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm pretty at peace with that as the meaning right now. Makes sense. While to you me. work on uh, yeah, exactly. spacecraft propulsion. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> like literal rocket science. Natalia, this is an amazing conversation. You work on such an exciting engineering field. And I think this is like what 20th, uh, 21st century will be remembered for is space exploration. So this is yeah. super exciting uh, space that you're working on. So, and thank you so much for spending your time with me today. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Natalia Bailey. And thank you to our sponsors, Monk Pack Low Carb Snacks, Four Sigmatic Mushroom Coffee, Blinkist, an app that summarizes books, and Sunbasket, meal delivery service. So the choice is snacks, caffeine, knowledge, or a delicious meal. Choose wisely, my friends. And if you wish, click the sponsor links below to get a discount and to support this podcast. And now, let me leave you with some words from Carl Sagan. All civilizations become either spacefaring or extinct. Thank you for listening, and hope to see you next time. This is the Lex Free Podcast.